I totally forgot where I was going with that. This is going to be an interesting recording. <laughs> Hi everybody! Uh, it's me, Mermeen, and Mirko uh, also is here, and we are bringing you live, but not live, because it's pre-recorded, a review of Why Can't Tori Read, which is Tori Amos's little-known first album before she became Tori famous. The band name, it's a reference to her not reading music when she was in school, and that being why she didn't go far as a classical pianist, because she wanted to improvise instead. But it took me the longest time to realize that it's actually why can't Tori read? Because I remember when I first saw it, I'm like, you can't Tori read. <laughs> the label was like, the piano girl thing is done. Every everyone is doing guitar stuff now. And so that's why they sort of forced her into this sound. And it's clear that this is not what she wants to do. But as we were listening to these songs on this album and going through, it also seems like the, the song doesn't that the songs themselves don't really have good bones to them. They're not really great songs from a, a purely like melody and harmony perspective. It's lots of uh, what Glee would call hairography. Yeah, like dressing it up with interesting textures and not even always interesting, just a lot of texture. The first song is the what was the lead single for the album the big picture or basically the big sky by kate bush <laughs> you know you said that and i've been thinking about it I, I get that but i actually hear a little bit more heads were dancing by kate bush in this uh, especially in the verses like the bass line is almost identical <laughs> yeah yeah big songs <laughs> I mean, it's pretty clear that she is uh, influenced by Kate Bush for a lot of this album, actually. I'm not the biggest fan of this song, especially because it sets off this tone of like, Tori's a bad girl, you kind of thing, that this whole album really wants to foist upon you. But even in her heyday, Tori was never really known for that. This song does have a music video and it's more big hair and she's got a sword and <laughs> there's a car <laughs> that's... I'm gonna go on a, a random tangent, but I promise it's related. Okay. I remember when I was a teenager watching TRL, someone was asked, what's your favorite Britney Spears video? And they said, I like Lucky because it really showcases her acting talent. And this video really showcases Tori's acting talent. Uh, it's got dialogue in the beginning, which is kind of more interesting than a lot of the rest of the video. I think my ratings might be a little generous. I'm going to keep them as they are, because it still doesn't, spoiler alert, this, this whole album doesn't end up with a good score. Well, it's interesting, right? Because it's hard to evaluate this album objectively because we know what came after in Tori's career. Like, if we were judging it on its own merits, I might actually be slightly nicer. Uh, slightly. I still wouldn't call this a good album, but it's hard not to think of the Tory we know and love while we right. listen to this. Right. And the only reason that we are covering this album is because it is a Tory album and it's interesting to see, you know, what made her. Second song, Cool On Your Island, which is my favorite song on the album. We both were talking in our notes about how this has got like a, a fun, islandy, breezy pop feel to it, and it, it, it works pretty well most of the time. Yeah, the 80s were really a heyday for that, I don't know what else to call it, but breezy pop sound. Yeah. The 80s were a big time for breezy pop, but this feels breezy, but still unique. But then the next song is the one that I do hate. Faith is really bad, I think. It's one of those, though, that Tori begins to come into her own in terms of phrasing because she manages to fit every vowel sound in the word faith. It's like, there's like a slight shade of ooh in the beginning. It's, yeah. it's impressive. It would be impressive if it weren't such a shitty song. She raps in the song, and it's not a thing that should have happened. <laughs> faith takes itself way too seriously. It also feels like every 80s heart song mashed up with a little bit of like a Janet Jackson beat. But again, without that sense of Janet Jackson fun. Right. Um, and the one thing heart has that saves them from total shit is, you know, their lead singer is completely awesome. And I love Tori. She doesn't have a bad voice, but she is not on that level in her vocalism. Also, 
this is the first track on the album that sounds like Toy was playing a lot of JRPGs. Because <laughs> of the way it's spelled F A Y T H, and it's it seems very fantasy story. I resent that remark, and so does Yuna from Final <laughs> Fantasy X. How dare you? But the Hymn of the Faith is a better piece of music than this. <laughs> Slightly better song, but not that much, is Fire on the Side. Um, this one, to me, just came off as just like immediately cheesy. I do like her performance in this song, but other than that, there's really nothing to this song. It's one of the more forgettable ones. It sounds extremely derivative of every 80s soft rock ballad. It's not the worst on the album, but it's not anywhere near the best. Then we've got the second JRPG-themed song, uh, Pirates, which I always want to call Parades. It does have some textural stuff to it, which makes this a little bit more interesting to listen to. There's that weird like whistle effect or something, that whale effect in the background, and I like that. Yeah, that's but cool. Other than that, again, this feels like a song dressed up with a lot of texture. Then we get to another JRPG song, Floating City, um, which is a little bit more interesting. And I actually really kind of dig the synth marimba that's going on in this song. First of all, I will say this is one of the more memorable melodies on the album. Like after I listen, I remember this better than, I certainly remember it better than Pirates actually, yeah. but it sounds like a Jefferson Starship B-side to me. <laughs> I'm not really, I don't get the message or the point of this song. Like, I'm not sure what she's trying to tell me here. And that happens a lot with Tori lyrics really throughout her career, but usually I can at least interpret some semblance of meaning and I can't with this. Or, or at least like get a strong emotion from the words that is aided by the performance. Um, but yeah, there's not really any of that in the song. Something that Ramin pointed out when we listened to this together when he was in town. All of these songs are mid-tempo songs. Like, the ones that are not are the slightly more memorable ones, generally. But, um, yeah, everything is very similar tempo all the way through this album. Incidentally, one of the only up-tempo ones was the one they picked for a single, which yeah. kind of makes sense. This is um, one of the songs that the way Tori sings backup vocals for herself is starting to like take form into the mature Tori that we're used to. Uh, it, like the way that she writes harmonies for herself to sing. On this album, she uses a lot of that jazz music idiom of like delaying the rhythm of your sung line where it's clear that you're not really doing what you wrote originally. And I like that. I just yeah. don't feel that these songs are worthy of that level of creativity. <laughs> Also, a, a lot of the melodies on this album seem to be like in tight little boxes and they don't really move around much. Like even Cool on Your Island, which I think works the best of the songs, the melody is in a really small range. Yeah, it's pretty much like a minor third to a fourth. Mi, fa, fa, mi, re, so, yeah. so, fa, mi, yeah. Several of these songs do have different registers in them. Like the, the uh, verses are in a lower register and the choruses are in a higher register, but then with once you're in that register, it's just this tiny little box that doesn't really move. Moving on to Heart Attack at 23, and this is one of the most promising songs on the album from the beginning, because it's got this cheeky little piano intro, which is, it sounds like Tori finally. Yes but then the rest of the song is not good. <laughs> and there are several actually that do that really from this point onward in the album where the piano intro at the beginning is really cool. And then just kidding. And it really, it literally feels like someone is taking a pillow and smothering her with it. <laughs> like she starts <laughs> to talk and they're like, nope, nope, nope. Um, this has that same synth marimba, which I still like, but it's like, you can pick a different one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and this one has a sax solo in it and just, the only sax solo that's worth anything is the one from Carly Rae Jepsen. Um, yes. Run away with me. me. Yes. <laughs> it's my favorite of her songs, I'll say. It's yeah. a worthy favorite. You deserve it. <laughs> um, but you don't deserve a heart attack at 23 or any age, or even the song Heart Attack at 23. I actually gave it a four, but it's still, like, that's a that's generous. And, it's, and I think it's largely because of that intro and because this one's a little bit faster <laughs> in the rest of the song. Okay, moving on to On the Boundary, um, which I, I, I think this might be the best melody on the album. Yeah, I, 
I actually don't hate this song. So I was thinking before we did this review, to me, a lot of music exists on two, like an X axis and a Y axis. The one axis is um, catchy versus interesting. And the other axis is emotional versus atmospheric. The issue with Tori trying to be in this like hairband drag thing she's doing is that hair bands and that side of 80s music is all about artifice, right? It's all about dressing things up. It's about catchy and not and, and like emotional, but never interesting. And I think that this song works well because she finds a way to sort of tap in a little bit into that, but it's extremely emotional. Um, and I like that about this song, but I still, it's, it's still not like something that I'm going to turn on and listen to of my own volition, you know? Right, right. Moving on to You Go To My Head. This song has fun melodies in it in each of the different sections, but it sounds so very cliche 80s. And this is the end of the 80s. This would have been forgivable if it were three or four years before this, that it sounded this 80s. <laughs> but yeah, people are like moving past it to new sounds at this point. And this is very much stuck in an earlier sound. Yeah, I wrote that, um, I remember Cool on Your Island and On the Boundary, but I don't remember this after I walk away and come back to it. Yeah. This one does have um, another um, vocal harmony thing that Tori does a lot, where the backup singer version of herself is singing a completely different melody on completely different words, which is um, something that she does a lot more of in all of her good albums. Yeah. There's a real counterpoint to it. Yeah. She's basically Bach. Right. That's what I always say. <laughs> Moving on to the last song, or three songs, <laughs> the Etienne trilogy, the Highlands, Etienne, and Skyboat song. We were talking about how this doesn't really feel like a trilogy of songs, but I figured it out. That overlong intro is the Highlands. <laughs> The actual part of the song that she sings is Etienne, and then the bagpipe playout, which again feels very Kate Bush, <laughs> is the Skyboat song. Yeah, but again, like she calls it a trilogy, I would say it's a highly embellished song. But I will say my thoughts have changed on this song since writing the review. Um, I kind of love it for how schmaltzy it is, like. It's not what I would call an interesting song, but I think the same part of me that like, um, this is the same part of me that, that sobs along to, to his schmaltzy hearts ballad, heart ballads in the eighties, yeah. sings along to this. It's that like, you know, hair blowing in the wind and, and kind of crying while I sing it uh, thing. And again, I think it works for me because she sounds so much more earnest on this song than on a lot of the rest of the album. And it is a fun melody to sing along with. Yeah, and I really, it also, incidentally, is one of the few songs on the album where the piano really shines. It's not just an intro and then we cover it up, right? We get that like, bum, ba, dum, bum, 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 like the whole time. Yeah, I think it does go on for too long. I, like, I, yes. would, I would like some variety in that piano part, and we know yes. that she is more than capable of putting variety in her piano parts. Um, but I was also like thinking just the piano part could really easily be the like middle of act one um, musical theater song that like the determined hero is like, I can do it. I can save the town by yes. raising money. <laughs> yes. It is very musical theater, isn't it? Yeah. I didn't notice that until you said that, but yes, that's a good observation. And that's um, not a bad, that's not a bad thing, but it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say the lyrics, ugh not here for the lyrics at all. Like even, I wrote, even ignoring the fact that that G word she says is a slur for Romani people, even before we knew that as a, a mainstream society, like that was already a cliche. I would love to hear like modern day, you know, middle-aged mom Tori sing this at a, a, a concert. Cause I feel like this is sort of where she actually is now, it seems, even though I don't like it nearly as much as most of my favorite Tory pieces. Um, I still think that she would probably really sell the hell out of it in concert. Couple last bits of discussion on this. Um, how cohesive the album is. One thing that I do think that this album has going for it is that 
these songs all do sound like they fit together into the album. It's not really the most exciting sound in the world, but it does sound like a very cohesive unit to me. So to me, I slightly disagree. I gave it a four instead of a five because of all those moments we've discussed where the piano part creeps in and then we smother it with a pillow. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that they either needed to get rid of those entirely, except for maybe Etienne, because it's a good album closer, um, or just let her be Tori, which they, of course, were not going to do based on what we already discussed. So that, like, I would say that across songs it's cohesive, but within songs it's not. That makes sense. Always. Yeah. yeah. But then to like balance the cohesion of it, um, there should be a little bit of variety and there's really not. This is this is this album's just like a lump of the same thing from almost all of it, with a couple shiny things poking out. With the exception of piano writing, everything else that she does on this album, it feels like I can get better from other artists in the 80s. I could listen to a Phil Collins album, I could listen to Hart, I could listen to all the artists we've mentioned here, uh, Kate Bush, um, and get a better version of it. Yeah, I agree. And then the last little point of info is the cover art, um, which is just, it's silly, but the silliness of it is why I gave it a two and not a one. (laughs) The the sword and this little stick figure, of the person with the sword chasing a dragon. (laughs) I, so Tori, I do think Tori is a legitimately beautiful woman. And I think that she became much more of a, not a sex icon, but a, her sex appeal became part of her image more when she was being sincere about it. A lot of artists put on weirdness as an artifice or kind of a way to separate themselves from the herd. Whereas Tori, much in the same vein of Bjork or Kate Bush or David Bowie has always felt authentically weird. Like this, I'm not being weird as a performance art piece. I'm I'm just weird. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was much more appealing to people, especially in the nineties when like alt rock became a thing and like, grunge and all these, you know, rejections of that 80s artifice were really coming into their own. But this just doesn't work for me. It, it really does feel like Tori and drag. So getting into the score for the full album now, uh, if we were going through just all these points of these individual songs here, that um, averages out to a 56% for this album. I gave the album a 65 and Ramin gave it a 63. When you average those all together, that gives this album a 61%, which is a D minus. It does seem like a low D effort, like barely passing at that, maybe not even passing. I think the biggest part of this is that it's a shame that she was so shackled by the label for this album, because we know that she's a brilliant musician. (laughs) Again, there's like moments, little glimmering moments where it seems like that's about to shine through and then put pillow over it. In thinking about this and thinking about how the producers really stifled her, it reminds me of, as a teacher, a public school teacher, how non-teachers at the administrative level are constantly stifling us too. And it's like, I'm willing to bet that almost none of those producers are half the musician that Tori is. In the 90s, her best work started to happen when she really started to break free of those shackles, right? Like, I think both of us have agreed that Under the Pink and um, Boys for Pele are maybe her two best albums. And yet, at the moment that they happened, you know, they kind of proved the producer's point because they weren't huge critical successes, especially Boys for Pele. Like, a lot of critics thought it was too abstract and it didn't do as well commercially, but it just goes to show you that it's not always the artists who do well commercially who are really breaking ground and who are really creating art. So you got to keep the big picture in mind. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking forward to reviewing the other Tori albums because we'll give the... Um, at least the next few much higher scores than this and probably all of them a much higher score than this (laughs) let's end this video by showing you the music video we made which we have not yet made but we're going to make (laughs) of uh our cover of cool on your island which i'm actually kind of really happy with how this cover turned out so i'm excited for everyone to see it (laughs) should we start doing all the like like and subscribe thing click Um, every button you see right now right oh wait don't click the thumb down not that one but click the rest of them. Just start yes. clicking things. Yeah. Yes. Go to and, town, you bastard. <laughs> and let us know what you want us to 
talk about coming up soon. Uh, we've already recorded the Media in 1988 video, so that'll be coming out soon. But then we uh, are going to start working on some album reviews of music from 89, which was a really good year for music. So if there's anything you want us to especially pay attention to from 1989, let us know if you have any opinions on things. Love to read your opinions. Now we can say, maintain your groovy selves. Maintain your groovy selves. <laughs>